Hey, this is Ashramal Things Dentistry, the place where we're passionate about sharing those unwritten hits and tips of dentistry. Well, today we're going to talk about matrices and prep design. And although this is for an amalgam restoration, whoa, don't leave, hold on. There's a whole bunch of things in here from experience and just what I've been taught and what I've learned from our new dentists, we've got a bunch of them, they're having problems placing the matrices. So I'm going to show you some tips to get around those little problems and have some success. So we finished the endo, tooth number 36. I'm going to throw it up here so you can take a look that we just did it. And the best time to place a, a, some sort of restoration, final restoration anyways, before you're, if you're going to place a crown, is right during this last sitting because the patient's still numb. You know what's, you know where you're, what you're, you know, you know all the anatomy, the intricate anatomy of the pulp chamber, and you're good to go. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually using this long shank diamond burr. We've removed the old composite that was in that tooth, or no, it wasn't composite. So the patient had some decay removal, and it was a, it was a resin modified glass ionomers uh, restoration. And what we're going to do here is what I was taught from my mentor is to make lines like this. It might not be exactly like this, but we don't really want it's difficult. And the reason. So what I'm saying is that it's difficult to put restorations when there's little, little points of flash of enamel and whatnot. Now, we have hand instruments for this. Certainly, if you're brand new, even as an old timer, I'll use hand instruments. But what we're doing is I'm trying to make straight lines. Because if you imagine you're trying to paint, you know, if you're painting a room, it's so much easier to paint a straight line with a brush or a roller rather than paint, you know, these like, crooked lines all the way along. So when you're finishing, so in terms of, because I always found in terms of dentistry, so I'm, let me just skip here for a second. We're gonna remove this amalgam as well. This is a provisional restoration, so it's being removed at the next appointment. We, we finished the endo, I'm gonna place this, and like, okay, we're gonna bring the patient back because he had uh, lost this restoration. So this is a glass honor that was placed previously. So um, I, I think the, the thing with tooth preparation is it's a balance between Minimal tooth removal for making the restoration, you know, minimal tooth structure removal, but it's also a balance between getting it so you can get your matrice down and actually have a great restoration, not just a kind of mediocre where there's, you know, especially with composite, it's easy to get little voids along the margin. If your matrice is not perfectly down, you're getting leakage. When you're, when you're placing your restoration, you're placing your bonding agent, and even with amalgam, you'll get an overhang. So it's a fine line, and it took me a long time to learn that that fine line. So what I'm gonna do here is, and actually as I was doing this, I'm like, I'm probably gonna replace this amalgam when I replace this because you can see it's pitting, it's fracturing, it's getting a little bit old. So thanks so much for making it to this video, this point this point in the video. You know, if you've ever felt alone during a root canal, ever felt stuck, you know, felt frustrated, I know exactly how you feel. I created a course to make people, to give people the opportunity to not feel that way. I also wanted to create a Facebook page where it was safe, a group, setting where it's safe where we can share ideas and fears and concepts and i want to introduce that that course to you because it's going to give you all the tools that i use every single day in a modular system and just to build your confidence you know i know what it feels like to be unconfident and not know what to do join us and i'm almost certain that you'll be able to tackle your first root canal without fear so I'm just using this diamond burr. You can use whatever you want, but I'm using it just because it's part of the endo blur block. I'm just removing any remaining kind of little bit of decay. You know, I recommend using a slow round burr for decay, but we're just kind of cleaning that up, that area in that mesial box, just to kind of get, you know, if there's there was a little bit of caries left in that, or not left, but remaining underneath that old restoration. And you know, that amalgam probably had been there, I think for, oh my gosh. <sighs> probably 30 years. I have amalgams in my mouth still when I was a kid. But one of the things that you can easily do, especially with these nitrile rubber dams, so you do your endo, all I do is I take the clamp. You saw me do it earlier, I didn't talk about it. I just move the clamp back and the whole rubber dam just moved with me. So here we are, we're just taking an overall look at the preparation. So we've got, in this endo there, it's tooth number three six. There were two mesial canals. I tried to find a middle mesial, it wasn't there. We have two distal canals. And then what I'm looking at is, you know, it's not so much, is there enamel? Because I saw on this Facebook page, you know, should you remove enamel, should you not? And I'm not going to argue that for bonding. Absolutely, it's necessary. But is is there a space, how about this? Is there a space where you can place your matrice actually down? I think that's much, a really critical point that might not be expressed 
in books and learning and whatnot, and especially if you're brand new and you're struggling with this, the, big, the biggest point that I find and in my own experience is not having this contact broken so you can place your matrix C down easily. I'm not saying burn it out and make a huge hole, but what I find is that it's that balance between minimal tooth structure removal versus actually trying to make a, a cleansable, proper sealed restoration that's gonna last. What we're gonna do is, so what I'm looking at here, so this is interesting and you could argue that you know, why we don't use amalgam. We could do a bonded amalgam, certainly. We could do a radicular retained amalgam approach. What I'm doing is I'm placing just little retentive little spots, tiny, well, this is number two, number two round. I was thinking like, hmm, how am I gonna retain this? Because the whole restoration, the whole preparation, uh, the old restoration, probably why, it, I don't know why it fell out. It was, I think it was decay or whatnot. But there just isn't enough retention. So I'm gonna place little divots everywhere. They're round, so they're not points points of stress, that's what went through in my mind. I could remove some more of this, um, some more of the gutta percha from the from the canals. Actually, I probably should have done that, but I wasn't thinking about it at the moment. I was just looking at, are my lines straight? And they're almost straight. This could be actually a little bit cleaner, that line right there. Oh yeah, what I was gonna do here is I was just making sure we have a minimum of two millimeters occlusal reduction for that amalgam preparation. Because when I've done amalgam preparations before in my life, I have it reduced because I was like, oh, I don't need to, I don't want to reduce uh, tooth structure. But the argue, the argument that I'm going to make is that when you do an onlay type of preparation, you're not reduced, you know, when you do a crown preparation, I'm just going to have out because I don't like, I'm not really a crown fanatic. I'm more of an onlay, whether it's direct or indirect. The problem is that when you, you know, prep for a crown, yeah, it's easier to do, it's faster. Everyone, you know, it's an easier preparation rather than an onlay but you strip the bark off this tree and you actually come closer with your, you know, for if you want a stress point or tooth reduction, tooth removal, tooth structure removal, you're coming closer to actually where these orifices are. So, you know, you can, you can have the most amazing endo access, tiny. It never made sense to me that if you're gonna save a tree, you know, say you're uh, an arborist, like, okay, I'm gonna save your tree Sir, ma'am, but the way we do it is we're going to strip all the bark off it. I'm going to wrap it in porcelain or I don't, you know, we're not going to make an impression of the tree. We're going to wrap it in saran wrap. And it never made sense to me to do that. So um, what I would argue is that using, using an onlay is a much more conservative preparation because you're not stripping the tree of its most important protecting, protection against the environment is a bark. Okay. Anyways, so what you're going to see here, and if you've made it into this, I've thought about this, I've contemplated including this in the video, but you've made it to this part in the video, so I don't think you're going to drop off. So what's happening here is I'm trying to use this transmetal burr. It's I'm only using it because it's rounded. I don't get a sharp, fine point because we're trying to reduce stress, points of stress. And as I was doing it, I zipped the restoration right there. So you can see here what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to straighten out, like we were talking before, trying to straighten out these lines so they're they're easy to finish and as I do that I get really and remember I'm using a microscope so I'm right at so there we are removing that trying to get a little bit of an opening but also trying to straighten that line up I'm not aiming to get undercuts because in the removal uh, the, I was noticing in this line back here this line right here uh, when I was watching this video to pick it up again a day later to voiceover I'm not going to do an undercut because that could be your argument. Like, well, why aren't you doing undercuts? You're doing an amalgam. The problem is, is that to remove, to make an undercut, I have to reduce this amount of tooth structure. So like, you know what? This is valuable tooth structure. Let's just use retentive elements in the preparation rather than do that. So, you know, I zing this tooth there with this, this burr. So what you're going to see me do, and this is part of just keeping it real, is addressing that and not just leaving it. And quite frankly, I wasn't very happy with the way you'll see the contour of that restoration um, after after I kind of finished it with a flame burr to smooth that out. So I probably will replace it because there was not really a, a height of contour in the uh, in this little amalgam here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my endo zebra, see if I can get it in there to try to make it more rounded. But you see how it's kind of a flat contact? It's like flat, and then it kind of becomes you know the point of of convexity is a little bit more apical. So that didn't fit. I'm going to take a flame burr. 
So this really wasn't intended part of the uh, part of the video. But we're going to include it anyways. And I'm going to open, you know, I'm going to clean up that occlusal embrasure. Other than that little spot and what I did with the amalgam, amalgam is totally fine. Even though it's a bit stained here, it totally looks fine. It's functional. It's serviceable. Okay, so what I'm doing here, as you can see, it's not in focus. This part is in focus. That's why it's duplicated. So I'm looking to see, like, okay, is this restoration still serviceable? And it looks like it is, but that zing that I did to it, it's kind of like, hmm. And again, I put this in here because you've made it to this point and just trying to keep it real because this is reality. It happens. And I mean, I'm using a microscope and I've been doing this a really long time and it still happens. So perhaps I could have used, you know, what I could have used instead of a, a rotating um, means of doing that, of trying to finish this line. See how it's a little bit straighter? It's just using hand instruments. So what we're going to do here is just kind of slow this, uh, smooth that out. My electric handpiece is not working in this bay at the moment, so I'm using a regular airspeed. But normally what I prefer is just an electric handpiece. I'd slow it down to about 1,000 RPMs with this burr in, and that would fix the problem. So I'm just running that, to trying to create that, con what I'm looking at is trying to recre recreate some sort of contour. I'm smoothing it out, but I'm also recreating some contour there. So it's not that bad, actually, now I look at it again. So let's just go back out and, you know, I'm focused. You're probably focused on what this burr is doing, but let's take a look here. So this is a little bit better. It could be a little, you know, we're much closer to what I want. It could be a little bit better, a little bit straighter. Uh, but when we look here, and what I was talking about before, I was thinking about it as I was re-watching the video, you could arguably wedge what I have done before. But I have been doing this a long time, so take that in consideration. If I can't get, you know, if this tooth is jammed up, right, especially a seven, an upper seven to an upper six between the contacts, say this is a seven, this is a six, you know, you have very little interverdicular space. What you could do is wedge it. I'm sure some of you are thinking, like, place a wedge, kind of give it, like, at the beginning of preparation, place a wedge, give it time for the teeth to separate just a little bit, and then by the time you're ready to place a matrice, you can go ahead. I found that that can be useful <clears throat> sometimes, sometimes not. It can be really hard. And if you're brand new, so to create that space, it can be really hard to do that. So, you know, take that into consideration because especially those um, composite matrices, some of them are so flimsy that it's just, you know, it's like tin foil, aluminum foil, aluminum foil. It just, you know, they don't even, they don't have not, they have no resilience to them. So they just bend when you place them in here. One of the things I am thinking about throwing out there as well is if you're brand new and you're worried about doing this, especially to a natural tooth, which I think we should all be, uh, there are defender wedges which have a little sleeve of metal that go over, that have a wedge. And uh, they're a wedge and they have a little piece of metal. And they're really useful. Okay, let's go ahead and let's keep going here. So I can't remember what else. So one of the last things we're going to do the other question you may ask yourself is like, why are you placing a direct restoration versus like an onlay? You're like 95% of the way there to place an onlay. Well, within the institution that I work, okay, so we're going to place our auto matrix. Um, we get these patients completed. They have their cuspal, cus cuspal coverage restoration completed, and then off we go. And then they're ready. You know, we don't have to bring the patient back for another appointment, whatnot. Um, it's a very transient population, so we're just going to get this, get this down. But you know, certainly that question is absolutely a great question. So we're going to be, you know, why not just do an indirect restoration, indirect only? Absolutely, it's the perfect time to do it. But we're not. So we're going to talk about <laughs> we're going to do our only amalgam. So we, I've been using this Automatrix thing. If you haven't used it. If you're placing amalgams like this, which I don't think you are, but the idea, again, the, the idea of this whole video is, you know, just getting the matrices down and some little tips to do that. And what I've noticed, and this is the other reason why I wanted to put this tip in, is pretend this is this is rubber dam coming up here, right here, but it's also pretend it's gingiva. And this is one of the problems I've been seeing with our new dentist is that gingiva will pop up and they'll be like, oh, I need to push that out of the way. They take their band off. Put it back down I'm like you don't need to do that you can just take your explorer and cut that out of there while it's down once you have a wedge in 
because once this is down, this is like the golden moment. Like, oh, it's down. It's not bent. Whew, we're good. So one of the things you can do before you start prepping, I forgot to mention that because I haven't been doing it because I'm a, I hate to say it, I'm an old timer, is pre-wedge your restorations because it can give you a little more, especially when you're, especially when you're, you know, you've got a brand new, not a brand new tooth, but you're, you don't know the apical extent. You can place your wedge in, you can have the defender wedge, but the wedge gives you a guideline of when you're, you know, you've broken through the box almost. So that can be really helpful. This video is not really about prep. Well, it is about prepping those. My intent was just fine lines, but I wasn't really thinking about uh, talking about this type of thing. Pre uh, pre prepping for prepping. So, okay, let's take a look here. What do we got? So I'm looking at my mesial box. So here's the mesial box. I'm like, sweet, we're down, we're good. Wedge is all the way through and it's closed. Distal, kind of like, mm. So if we look, this is the lingual in the mirror. I'm kind of like, eh, you know, I need to seal this up because placing amalgam, even placing composite, you're going to get an overhang. Um, well, amalgam composite may not, it might be just an open gap. So I'm kind of thinking through my mind, okay, I need to rip this out. I'm not, I could either pull my rubber dam out or I could just take my Explorer and cut it with my, uh, yeah, with my Explorer. I can pack Teflon into this corner or I can take another wedge because we didn't have, of course, we didn't have Teflon in that bay. So what I'm gonna, you're, what you're gonna watch me do is try to take another, another wedge and try to place it from the lingual. Now I find, and we're gonna, okay, so we're gonna burnish that out. So we're gonna burnish lots of burnishing. Now remember, this restoration is being removed um, in the next week, I think. You know, you could say, why didn't you do it at this point? I think at this point in my career, I really want to do quality. Well, I've always wanted to do quality. I think, you know, trying to race and get lots of things done at the same time, I find that it tends to, you tend to end up not doing a, such a great a job. And then you end up having to reverse and go backwards in time and have to redo stuff, like if, whether at that appointment or another one. So I'm kind of, you know, and that's, that's even what I find when I'm, fixing my vehicles and dirt bikes and other stuff we have around the house, you kind of, if you shortcut it, you're like, ah, you just got to go back. So I'm just using my ball burnisher here, burnishing the heck out of that C, just to make sure we've got a great contact. One of the things you can do, and I haven't been doing, and I really should be, is these are wooden wedges, and if I don't find the proper contour, you can take like a 15 blade and contour kind of a little bit of the portion here. Oh, you can see here. So imagine that's gingiva. I'm going to cut it or well here I'm just pushing it out of the way. Now so I'm just kind of figure out like what am I what's going on here? And what I'm doing here is I'm like I'm closing it. So I'm like okay, I'm pushing I'm pushing actually to the mesial with my explorer to see if I can close that little gap. And that's not good enough. Like I'll be honest, this is not good enough. If you're thinking of placing a restoration here and you're like, "Ah, oh, it's good enough. I'll be able to you know, if it's amalgam, I'll be able to pull that, you know, figure that out when I get to that. It's not good enough. I've tried. Take my take my advice. <laughs> not good enough. If it's a composite, not good enough. It's leaking. You got to get that perfectly sealed. So enough of that. So I'll, I'll heed my own advice like that is not good enough. Because what's going to happen is that you're going to get something else is going to take your attention. Something else is going to you know, become a, an, an issue, whether you fracture the amalgam or the patient starts something in terms of patient management, and then you forget about that and you place your restoration and now you've got a gap and then you're like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go, now you got to go backwards again. Now you got to cut the thing out. So you really, I remember Dr. Yard, you know, he always asked in my residency, you know, what's the most important step of what you're doing? what's the most important start, step of this restoration? And you're kind of like, I don't know, maybe it's the prep. He's like, no, it's the step you're on. I'm like, ah, damn it, you're right. His name was actually, if you watched old, old videos, you know, from 10 years ago, his name was actually Dr. Dre. I, what I did was I reversed a lot of the names, or I gave them random names, but he, I reversed his name. So he's actually Dr. Yard. He was a prosthodontist. He was a great, crusty old man. Mainly crusty because he had a lot of pain from just years of abuse of being a prosthodontist and sitting in weird positions. And um, 
Yeah, he was so crusty, but he taught me so much. And one of the things that he taught me was, you know, that little saying I just said, what's the most important step involved in this procedure? And it's the one you're on, especially in removable prosthodontics because there's so many freaking steps. So what you're watching here is a little bit of frustration. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to see if I can get that wedge, keep this wedge in here and wedge this one in, but it's just not going to work. Teflon would have been easier. So what we're going to do is I'm going to actually remove that wedge. And I think what's valuable, I'm just going to, I'm letting this run out because then you can see that it's a hard thing for me to watch these amazing restorations on, you know, they look amazing. The problem is they don't really talk about what's going through your mind and the freaking weeds and the, the problems. I'm not saying that on this amazing guy. I'm just showing you that even, you know, we all have these issues daily. <clears throat> And it really is a mental game. It really is, I think, if breaking down, because I'm listening, I listen to a lot of sports psychology. There we go. Boom. So what, you know, imagine this is gingiva. I think there's a little bit of gingiva in here. Take my explorer. I think that's the next step. I'm gonna, oh, okay, I'll rinse it out just to see. Oh, we'll blow some air. So I'm going to pretend this is a little bit of gingiva here. Like, this is still not acceptable. I'm going to remove that. I'll take, you'll see my, take my, oh, okay, you won't. You will see me take my explorer at some point, I hope. And just make sure that's no gingiva there. So when I'm burnishing, what I'm doing here is I'm actually keeping the band down, making sure that I'm not pulling the band or moving it because it gets a little bit dicey here. It's kind of like a joke in my dental system, like, okay, no breathing. So there's a little bit of hemorrhage there. Let's see what it is. I don't know why I haven't washed yet. Oh, okay, there. So it's out. It's gone. Okay, so this is what I'll do with my explorer. So if there's a little bit of, I'll remind you, say it again. If there's a little bit of gingiva sitting up, I'm just going to go clip it off, done. So that's sealed. All right, let's see here. Back here. So this little minor gap. Now, I didn't see that when I was doing this. But I think what we could have done it better is place some Teflon and packed it into that little corner. Now, am I, you know, am I going to be able to deal with that when, okay, wait a sec. Okay, I washed it. Oh, okay, never mind, it's sealed. So that was just a residual. Okay, never mind, I did seal. But what you could have done is taken some Teflon and packed it in uh, from the buckle, because that is, where are we? Where's the old buckle? Oh, it's from the lingual, actually. So we could have packed some from the lingual uh, to get it in there. So we're all sealed up again. So we're sealed. We're good. Now, I mean, so I appreciate, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let, you know, this is the point where you can drop off if you're not interested in watching the rest of this huge amalgam that's going in. I really appreciate, I'm grateful for your time watching. Um, you know, go ahead and put any hints, any hints and tips that you have. You know, if you're, if you're a brand new dentist, anything that's kind of holding you up, in terms of having placement of matrice problems or preparation problems. You know, if you're an experienced dentist and you have any tips, please go ahead and put them in the comments. And I'd actually like to, because I think this is a thing that um, I'm seeing more and more and more is that unfortunately, some of our clinicians that graduated through coronavirus, are these are the things that, you know, we're doing hands-on training, especially in third and fourth year dental school. This is a thing that you had an experienced clinician kind of sit down with you and walk you through and show you. And I think, unfortunately, coronavirus has kind of impeded a little bit of that. Anyways, thank you so much for joining me. And if you're going to continue on this flight, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to speed through placing this amalgam restoration. And I'll just kind of go over some of the things that uh, I do. These I do pretty much on a daily basis. So we're just placing an amalgam carrier. I can tell, American amalgam, we're just packing it in there. I can tell you that these carriers, my dental assistant, everyone I work with, we complain, we do not like them because they just do not have the ergonomics. They're great because they have two ends, but the, it seems like the, the plastic carriers that kind of have a more of an ergonomic bend to them um, seem to be a little bit easier to use. So we're just packing that in there. One of the things you can do is if you're using this auto matrix, what you can do is place some Teflon in the gaps, kind of where the contour, you know, where the contour of the tooth stops. And there's a gap, you can place that in there so you don't have to pack it full of amalgam. I just have never done that, so I just pack it full. 
And what we're doing here is, I'm I'm, what I'm doing is, I'm actually, I'm just going to fill it right to the brim. It makes it much easier. But as I'm carving it, a couple of things that go through my mind are, where are the marginal ridges of the, of the adjacent teeth? That's very helpful. If it's a seven that I'm doing this on, I'm going to be making sure that I reduce the, especially when I place the amalgam, I reduce the distal lingual, distal buccal kind of portion, because those are always the pieces that break off and cause a lot of frustration. And if you can do this, if you can place your restorations, these large restorations with a rubber dam on, my gosh, you will save not only time, if you're, it'll save time, it'll save frustration, it'll actually most likely improve, I don't have any literature on that, but likely improve the outcome of your restoration, probably both amalgam and composite because you're not getting that saliva in there. You know, granted, we're not using a bonding technique, but if you're trying to, you know, I'm going to argue, and I just read another article talking about coronavirus, you know, COVID-19 and using rubber dams and, you know, the usefulness of rubber dams to prevent coronavirus. I'm on the fence about that, but anyways, it probably does help. But I can tell you for absolute certainty, with doing with increasing with increasing your technique, um, just making your restoration not so much better. You know what? I'm not going to say that. Just making your life easier, having a rubber dam on to do these things way easier. Because I'm not dealing with the tongue. I'm not dealing with these amalgam particles falling to the back of the throat. We're not dealing with any of this. We're not dealing with saliva. We're just like focused on this restoration and just fairly simple patient management. So the, what I've done here is I was talking through all this. What I'm doing here, um, let me back up here, sorry. So I'm going to take my Explorer or that interproximal carver. It's a really sharp instrument. I'm going to find my en enamel. So that's the first thing I'm going to do, finding where the enamel is on the buccal lingual side. What we're going to try to do is we're going to address anything that comes in contact with gingiva first as much as possible before tackling. It's kind of a combination. So this is an interproximal carver. You can see it's not only has a bend, you know, a hook like this, but it also uh, comes this way. I can't, it's hard in, th in two dimensions to describe it. It's not a scalar, it's an actual interproximal carver. It is incredible for this purpose. So <clears throat> I'm going to use very minimal instruments. That's kind of the way it is. Just the way I've gotten used to life in terms of dentistry anyways, in terms of like, minimal, but what you need is necessary. So we're going to be, and so the point is, is we're going to be addressing as much of anything that's in contact with gingiva before we address occlusal. Because anything in occlusal, I can address with a round burr. I don't think I do in this video, but if, you know, if I'm taking my time, if I'm going slow for some reason, I can reduce the occlusal with a round burr, no problem. It's really hard for me to take that round burr and try to address any type of overhang or whatnot. So I guess what I'm doing here, well, I know what I'm doing. I'm addressing the occlusal embrasure on the distal. I'm trying to use that to even it off. I'm still pretty high. No, maybe not. I'm getting close to where that marginal ridge is on the adjacent tooth. That's what I'm looking for there. And I timed it. I finally, you know, I videoed so many of these and I finally evaluated the time this time is not, at the time I have in my clock here is not the same, but it usually is like nine minutes from the start of this amalgam to this point here where we clip this off. So what we're doing is we're cutting that clip. This is the other reason why, you know, rubber dam is really critical, especially using the, the automatrix because this little clip can go, you know, usually we'll have a suction for doing it. I don't really do these without a rubber dam on. Um, but there's little pieces that can fall and get aspirated. All right, so what we're doing here is we're pushing, the, I'm not taking this off. I'm not that crazy yet because I've, we got to wait till this amalgam's not fully set, but you know, a good set, good portion. Then we're going to do is I'm trying to remove this clip. I don't always remove this clip, but I don't want it to get into the patient's uh, oral cavity. So I'm going to remove that, get that suctioned out. And then what we're going to do is we're going to open it up like a little gift. And then I'm going to address this amalgam here. So I'm going to push that out of the way. I think my dental assistant's actually, oh, she's holding it right there, so that's helpful. I'm noticing that, I don't know what this band, this blur band is. I have no idea what that is. Anyways, we'll work around it. I think it's in that iPhone holder I have. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm actually stretching. I'm trying to stretch the band this way. So I'm stretching it, but maybe pulling it a little bit through the contact, just to make sure 
that we're going to not break the restoration because if we take, you know, the risk is you take this band off, whole thing goes. So what I'm doing here is I'm slowly addressing any of that gingiva right here, but I'm stretching it. But then what happened was this thing is so sharp, it actually started cutting the, the, uh, the matrices, which is the first time I've ever had that happen. And it's not a bad thing, actually. It kind of gets it out of the way. But again, I'm dressing anything that comes in contact with gingiva. That's the most important stage right now. And you can see I just drew a line in the restoration. I was like, ah, haven't done that before. What had happened was my tip wasn't all the way onto enamel because that's what I'm doing. So I'm keeping my the tip of that restoration, tip of that instrument is, you can see right, oops, right here. That tip is always on to structure. So as I drag it, drag it through, it's on contacting enamel. That way I don't get any you know divots and little spots like that that can cause you grief. So I take those uh, wedges out. I was really, <laughs> I was like, let's just try it. That's my usually first go to is use that uh, to skewer it. But if it doesn't work, then I'll grab a set of hemostats. And then, you know, usually I don't do this, but I think I was kind of like, hey, let's get this, uh, let's get the show on the road. Usually I'll dress more with the interproximal carver with the with that out. But I was kind of like, okay, if, and we're getting set. So we're going to take this out. So what we're doing is replacing force on the marginal ridge with a plugger. And then I'm just going to, I'm taking that matrix C out this way, but it's not coming. So I'm kind of like, oh, I really got it. I burnished that pretty tight. So let's do this again. So I'm using hemostats and we're going to slowly wedge that, pull that out of there. So I'll get a little bit of a bite. We'll move it up. There we go. Yeah, so you can, you're kind of thinking like, listen, your hemostat's on the wrong side, but we'll get it. So again, I'm pulling this way, not pulling straight up. There we go. That's a good sigh of relief. And then on the mesial one, we're going to do the same thing. It's either this way, it's going to come out this way, or it's going to go out that way. And it looks like it came straight up. <laughs> so that was not the intent. All right, so now we have more work to do. And let's see if I go, yeah, we're going to address interproximal. That's the most difficult. So we're going to get rid of any of that interproximal flash, anything like that. Now, the beauty of having it fully sealed is that I don't have to deal with this much. I'm still going to because you never know if some gets, you know, you pack it down and it weasels its way out. And then we're going to address that contour. This instrument is beautiful for that. So you can see that like most of the work right up until now, it's just one instrument. It's not two or three, it's just one simple one. And it's just an interproximal carver. I have no idea what the number is. I can put it in the description box below when I go find it. So same thing on the mesial. We're going to address any of the interproximal, right interproximal. And you got to be careful because if you pull too hard up, this restoration may still fracture. So it's kind of a balance of kind of like scratching versus actual carving. So immediately in the gingival embrasure, and I can't stress this enough that, you know, you can adjust, you haven't seen me adjust the occlusion at all because it's really anything that I can't get, you know, it's really hard. Okay, so here we are. We're still just kind of monkeying around with gingival contour. I'm trying to, again, remove, trying to look at the overall contour now. So gingival contour, now the overall contour, while well, it's still carvable. And then we tackle with, whoops, then we tackle with tackle occlusal. So what I'm doing is, this is one tip, actually, from one of my mentors taught me, was do not pull away. So like, for example, in the mesial, it's easy to pull with the instrument towards the mesial. What I'll do is I'll line it, I'll take my instrument and I'll line it right against the marginal ridge of the adjacent tooth and I'll carve it down to that height. One of the things you can do is pre-mark your teeth before. I mean, it's not really helpful in this case, 
because we don't have any other cusps, we're making the whole thing. Uh, but if you have a, if you still have a few cusps available, you know, you can pre-mark to kind of give you an idea where the contacts are. What I'm doing here is now I'm looking because I'm like, wow, what's into my mind? So what is going through my mind? Time. And I'm also thinking about how much, you know, the adjacent teeth, the height of them, and where am I going to be when I reduce too much in the occlusal? Am I going to be contacting too structure? Because I've done that many times before in the previous years. But what I've learned is that just over with experience and time, proper reduction will prevent that. And it's just one of those, you just got to learn it kind of things. So what we're doing here is I'm just looking at, I'm not really looking right here because I'm, what you're seeing and what I'm seeing are two different things when you, in the microscope. So I'm really focused on here. But as I'm watching the video, I'm like, oh, I can see how much height I have. So that's really why, you know, the two millimeters of reduction are super critical when you're doing these types of restorations and even porcelain, making sure you have proper reduction. How many times, how often have I had, you know, even in my own experience, just not reducing enough and then having either the impression come back after it's been poured by the lab or, you know, can you, they send this uh, reduction coping kind of thing or you reduce the, the opposing, you know, just reduce it properly the first time. And take the time. That's the thing. Anyway, so I'm making sure. So what's going to prevent? So two things. What's going to prevent me from breaking this right right now and the patient down the road? Proper reduction, because if I have you know enough amalgam when I'm carving this, it's not going to break because there's a bulk behind it to prevent that fracturing. I have had a fracture actually lots of times. I actually had one fracture a few weeks ago, and if. I can post that video if you're, you know, if you're doing, I'm not going to post it because no one really does these, but if you're doing it and you want to see how I repaired it, uh, go ahead and put it in the comments below and I'll throw that up. I might just keep it unlisted and link it to you um, because, again, this is unfortunately becoming antiquated, uh, but it is useful because I've seen these last decades. So I remember my mentor, another mentor of mine, so the same guy who went to Endo, and just texted me, I think I mentioned that earlier in the video, texted me last weekend. Um, he taught me about a few things, you know, about doing these large amalgams. We don't really, you know, anatomy is amazing, but it just, is it really critical? Is it going to increase the longevity of the restoration? No, not at all. It just makes you feel better inside. So really what we're looking for is just, he used to call them sluice ways, sluice ways. Essentially a groove from front to back on this tooth, just to make sure we're in occlusion and you know, proper kind of decent inclines. That's about it. That's what we're looking for. You're not going to see me get into super detailed. I'm just telling you, showing you the way it is because this is going to be a functional restoration. So the next thing we're going to do is what's always going through my mind again is reduction, contours, making sure, because at some point you're not going to hear it, but uh, I asked my dental assistant at the time who I'm working with, um, Kind of, I keep seeing at the time because we switch around here and there, um, just because you know coronavirus, somebody's sick, this and that. You know, ask her is you know, is it too high? Is there anything I can change? Uh, so they'll say because they have a different perspective, right? And we're working with like a team. It's not just me. So I'm using that interproximal carver to to try to carve out a decent occlusal embrasure. I'm getting hooked up on that little thing there. So minimizing, you know, trying to keep those straight lines, like it comes back to having straight lines in your prep, minimizes the problems of little, you know, your instruments getting hooked on something. So yeah, there was a little bit that I wasn't happy right there in terms of that contour. You know, is this going to be like something I'm going to put in an operative textbook? No. Is this going to be, is this functional going to work? Yes, absolutely. Was it done in one sitting? Yes. Is the patient going to fracture the tooth? No. Now, we're trying to set up all the conditions of success for uh, success for our endo. So we're just kind of now getting kind of large contour ideas and trying to, I'm like, okay, now it's time to create, it, make it look like at least it's a tooth. There's some contour. Get a couple lingual cusps. You've got to be careful because you don't want to carve too close to kind of that margin that uh, the, the lingual margin because then what happens is it thins it thins out the, the restoration and then it potentially fractures 
and kind of overall. Let's go ahead and speed this up. There we go. So we're just using that inner process. You see how useful that instrument is because the beauty, let me go back, it has that curve and it almost seems like when they actually create it, that curve is so useful for creating this contour, this contour, um, this contour, you know, as you spin it around. It's like a magical thing. What I've learned is that if you, <laughs> you're, you will make, you know, if you're given a knife and fork to make this, you know, give yourself two years, you'll be able to make this amalgam with that knife and fork as well. You'll figure out a way. So we're going to check our contacts. Boom, we're good. Check it again. Boom, we're good. Yep. So I'm happy with that. Good contact there. So we're all cleaned up. I'm just going to double check anything. I think this is where, you know, I'm just double checking the contours, major contours. You're not seeing me spend lots of time on my beautiful little, hopefully I don't. It's just contours. That's really what's important. And this is where she's like, okay, well, I think the lingual portion is just a little bit too high from her vantage point. Now, is it going to be perfect like this tooth behind it? No. Not at all. And that's not the intent. Let's speed this up. You get the idea. Just making it finish a little more here. Okay, so we're going to get the patient to check their bite. And one of the things to do is to get them to lightly test. I don't know if we can actually see what's going on here. Let's go speed up because I took it out. So we'll get them to bite down. But one of the things that I first do before I get them to bite down is I'll get them to close their teeth together. Let's go ahead, bite down. And what they're doing here is I'm asking them, do your does the opposite side, the right side, does it feel normal when you bite down? And if they're kind of like, like I'll get them to bite down lightly and they're kind of like, oh, no, it still feels high. Then I'll get some including, actually first, then I'll look to see if there's any mark. And then not, because it's a fresh paper, then I'll get them to lightly tight down. And then we're kind of like, okay, well, you can see I'm seeing mark there. I'm seeing a mark there. I'm sorry it's not in focus. I'll get them, and there were no marks. So I'm like, kind of like, hmm, interesting. I'll get them to squeeze down. I think there's another mark kind of right. There's that ah, distal corner again. And the buckle. So we'll lightly adjust that. If it starts to get really, you know, if the amalgam starts to really set up, I'll just use a, a really a number six large round burr. I'm not going to try to scratch steel with my little instrument here because by the way the time that sets up it's just crazy hard so we'll adjust that and again at before we're done I'll ask the patient do your teeth you know if they're not numb up on the opposite side do your teeth feel like they're contacting normal on the opposite side and that gives them a, it gives me a really good sense and then what I'll do I don't know if I did it here I'll look to see if all their teeth are connecting contacting when they're in MIP. So when they bite down, oh, we're in focus again. There we go. So just a little bit more. And then when they're in, you know, I don't know if I do, like I said, if I, I'll do it, I'll get them to bite down and then I'll keep their lips, I'll just move their lips open to see if their teeth are connect, you know, if it's an MIT, MIP and anywhere facets are lined up or whatnot. Okay, so we're just adjusting here and then I'll burnish, and you can't see it, but what I'm doing is I can barely see it myself. I'm just taking a burnisher. I'm going to go around the margins, make sure I burnish them closed. And that's it. And then what we'll do is you'll see, I'm just going to throw up the post-operative x-ray. You can see I'm happy with all, I didn't take a bite wing. If you really want to make sure all the things are closed up, use a bite wing. Make sure you don't have any flash or overhang. Use a bite wing. And then that's it. So thank you so much for joining me all the way to the end of this like incredibly ridiculously long video. Uh, go ahead and put your comments below and let me know if you're actually using Amalgam. I'm really, I'd be interested. Anyways, thank you so much for joining me. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers.